Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining um, our KIPAC public lecture. Uh, we've been quiet for a while, but we're, uh, we're resuming um, online only today, but soon to be in hybrid. Um, my name is Risa Wexler. I'm the director of the Kobli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford and Slack. And um, we're really happy to uh, restart this uh, series of public lectures. Um, today's speaker is a really special uh, guest, um, Susan Clark. Um, Susan is our newest faculty member at Stanford. Uh, she's an assistant professor of physics. Um, she's an astrophysicist whose primary uh, research is focused on cosmic magnetic fields, magnetohydrodynamics, and the interstellar medium. So lots of big words, but you're going to learn a lot about what those all mean today if you've never heard those words before. Uh, most of you probably do know about uh, magnetism. Um, Susan and her group work on these uh, topics with a combination of observations in a variety of wavelengths, simulations, and theory. Um, Susan, before she came to Stanford um, this past fall, uh, she was a NASA Hubble Fellow and she was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. She got her PhD uh, from Columbia in, in 2007, where she was also an NSF graduate fellow. She's been a fantastic member of the community uh, since she joined us, and I'm sure you'll be hearing about, from her again in the future. Um, so really delighted to have Susan here today. Um, before we start, I'm going to now pass this off to Sinan Du. Uh, Sinan is our new Outreach and Engagement Manager at KIPAC, and she is really um, going to be spearheading a lot of our initiatives. I'm, we're thrilled to have her on board at KIPAC as well. So uh, welcome, Sinan, and I'll pass it off to you. Thank you very much, Risa. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sinan Du, and I am very excited to be joining this amazing team at KIPAC. And I'm sure I will be seeing all of you for many times in the future as we're rolling out more outreach events and programs. So uh, just wait to hear from us um, in the near future. Um, for today's event, um, this is the way that we're gonna do it. Um, aside from Susan being the main speaker, we're also going to have a few chat moderators who are all subject matter experts uh, to be managing the YouTube live chat, which you can see on the right-hand side. Um, so now, um, well, before we go into that, I will also, um, uh, introduce Dan, well, to reintroduce Dan. Um, many of you already know Dan. Um, he has been amazing hosting all the past public lectures. Um, Dan, you want to say a few words? Yeah, thank you, Zinan. Uh, just to say it's wonderful to be back with our Discover Our Universe series. Um, it's great to see our regular guests and to our new guests, welcome. Thank you, Dan. Um, great, and now I am going to let the chat moderators to introduce themselves. Um, George? Hi, I'm a physics PhD student at Stanford. I work with Susan on studying the interplay between dust and magnetic field in our galaxy and how it affects our measurements of the cosmic microwave background. I'm glad to be here and I hope you enjoy our event. Thank you, George. Um, and next up we have Rob. Hi all, uh, I'm Rob Cameron. I'm a staff scientist at the Slack National Accelerator Lab. Uh, I uh, am uh, working in astronomy and astro and some particle astrophysics, and uh, I'll be uh, hopefully able to answer any questions you throw at me, maybe. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, and last but not least, Ari. Hi, I'm Ari. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford, and I spend most of my time building specialized radio telescopes to study the cosmic micro wave background. Very cool. Thank you. So um, if you have any questions uh, during the talk, um, feel free to directly put them into the chat, or even those are comments, you're more than welcome to put those in the chat. Um, most of the questions will be answered by the chat moderators while they come in. Um, some of those will be saved for Susan um, to answer at the very end. And since we have a relatively large group today, we kindly ask you to be respectful to each other. Um, and without further ado, uh, let's get started. Susan, take it away. Thank you so much, 
Sinan and Dan and Risa and all of our chat moderators. I hope, oops, give me one second. I hope that you can now see my screen. Yes, okay. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here to kick off our, our talk series for 2022 and to tell you today about one of my absolute favorite topics to ponder and to study and to talk to other people about, and that is cosmic magnetism, magnetic fields uh, within and beyond our galaxy. And my plan for you today is for us to go on a bit of a whirlwind tour of magnetic fields in our galaxy and beyond. And we'll, we'll start right here on Earth, where magnetism has really fascinated humans for thousands of years. I, I was looking into the history of magnetism a little bit to put together this talk, and at least as far back as the fourth century BC, Chinese scholars were writing about the ability of some magnetic rocks to move iron. And I, I love this quote from Aristotle that the lodestone, a type of magnetic rock, has a soul because it moves iron. So for thousands of years, humans have been uh, thinking about and, and being curious about magnetic fields. And these days we, we don't talk about the souls of rocks so much as we use uh, the, the language of physics. We talk about magnetic fields as describing the influence that acts on moving charged particles or currents or chunks of magnetic material like this paperclip. And so today we're really continuing in this, in this tradition of thinking and wondering about magnetic fields, but we're going to take that curiosity off this earth and out into space. So the earth, as you're probably aware, has its own planet scale magnetic field. So this is a virtual talk. We, we may not all be in the same room right now, but we're all sitting in the magnetic field of the Earth. The Earth's magnetic field is, is generated and sustained by electric currents from the motion of the liquid metal in the core of our planet and the rotation of the Earth. And these generate this planetary magnetic field that's visualized here by this, this artist's impression. Uh, this is not something that is easy to take a picture of, so we have a, an artist's depiction of what it looks like. But this is the magnetic field that gently turns the needle on your compass to point toward the magnetic pole, to point north. Uh, and, and that is, of course, extremely useful if you are, for example, uh, lost in the woods. But the Earth's magnetic field is actually more helpful to us on a daily basis than we might all uh, generally appreciate. So another thing that the Earth's magnetic field is doing for all of us right now is uh, keeping us alive by deflecting uh, particles from the solar wind. So as you know, the Earth orbits our, our nearest star, the sun. The sun is constantly emitting charged particles in a stream that we call the solar wind. And this wind is really high energy radiation that if we, if we just bathed in it directly would be extremely harmful to humans. So lucky for us, the presence of the Earth's magnetic field deflects most of these particles and keeps us safe. So we have here another artist's impression of the, the magnetic field of the Earth shielding us from this solar wind. And the Earth's magnetic field isn't just keeping us safe from the solar wind directly, it also keeps the solar wind from stripping away our atmosphere. So without the magnetic field to deflect it, the solar wind would surely strip away the ozone layer that protects us 
from harmful solar radiation. And so here's a, a little more of a dramatic visualization of what I mean here. This is again an, an artist's rendering, but a, a rendering of real models of how we think the Earth's magnetic field protects us from these particles whizzing at the Earth from the sun. So in reality, these, these particles are ions and electrons. They're way too small to see with the human eye. But this movie is, is a dramatization of how the presence of the Earth's magnetic field deflects these particles and, and keeps us safe. And so I, I hope this gives you some appreciation for our place in space, not as an isolated rock, but it is as part of a solar system uh, connected magnetically to what's going on uh, from, from the sun. And, and the activity of the solar wind is itself related to the presence of a magnetic field in the sun. So the sun and other stars have their own stellar magnetic fields that are responsible for all sorts of fascinating magnetic activity, uh, both, both on short time scales and also over the, the length of a lifetime of a star. Uh, this is an area of very active research by solar physicists and by people who study other stars than the sun, uh, including people here at Stanford. And so I've, I've now shifted to showing you real data. These are observations of the sun in the extreme ultraviolet, so in a wavelength much shorter than what we can perceive with our human eyes. But this is showing you uh, magnetic loops and all sorts of magnetic activity on the sun that is observed over a period of several days and then sped up to make a nice succinct movie. All of these are, are fascinating examples of astrophysical magnetic fields, but most of my research is focused on uh, a type of magnetic field that you might be even less familiar with. And so today I want to focus primarily on understanding the fact that galaxies themselves have magnetic fields. So we've, we've just zoomed way out from the scale of an individual planet or star and entire galaxies like our own Milky Way are home to large galactic scale magnetic fields. So on the left here, this is an image, again, real data, of the Whirlpool Galaxy, also known as M51. This is one of these classical grand design spiral galaxies, meaning it has these, these really dramatic spiral arms where a lot of ongoing star formation is taking place. And to the left is, is just showing you uh, this galaxy, but on the right, we've added additional data to the image, real data, that is showing you measurements of the magnetic field of this galaxy. And we'll talk in just a bit about how it is that we can actually go about measuring magnetic fields in space. But I want to take a moment to put this into a little bit of context in terms of the strengths of the magnetic fields that we're going to be talking about today. How strong are these astrophysical magnetic fields? And we will have this conversation in relation to a magnetic field that is probably familiar to many of us. When you, when you get an A on your homework and you wanna stick it to your refrigerator, you might use a refrigerator magnet. That's a, that has a magnetic field that has a strength and that's going to be our point comparison. And I've, I've made us a little plot here. Each of these tick marks is going to indicate the relative strength of magnetic fields relative to our refrigerator magnet. And each of these ticks is going to be a factor of 10 in the magnetic field strength. 
So this tick mark is a magnetic field strain 10 times stronger than our refrigerator magnet. This one is 10 times weaker, 100 times weaker, and so forth. So I want you to just think to yourself for a minute. Think about the last time you, you stuck a drawing or a piece of homework to the refrigerator. And think about the needle turning on your compass. Where do you think we should plot the, mag the strength of the magnetic field at the surface of the Earth? And, and I'll give you just a second to think to yourself and decide whether you think that's stronger than a refrigerator magnet or weaker and, and how much in either direction. If you want, you can put your answer in the chat or jot it down as a note to yourself or just, uh, just think to yourself for a moment. All right, we'll put this in some sort of concrete terms here. So, uh, astrophysicists tend to measure magnetic fields using a unit called Gauss, abbreviated with a capital G. And your typical run-of-the-mill refrigerator magnet is going to be about 50 or 100 Gauss. So that's going to be our, our point of comparison. The Earth's magnetic field at the surface is only about half a Gauss, so about 100 times weaker than your typical fridge magnet. That means that the, the thing that sticks your homework to the refrigerator is 100 times stronger than the magnetic field that we're sitting in here on the surface of the Earth. Now, when we start talking about interstellar magnetic fields, the magnetic field of our galaxy, we have to stretch our plot a bit to the left here because the strength of the galactic magnetic field, which we have measured, uh, nearby to the sun, so at the location in the galaxy where the sun is, is on the order of micro gauss. So a, a million times weaker than the magnetic fields that we're talking about uh, on, on the surface of the earth that we are familiar with in our everyday. This is not even scratching the surface of the full range of magnetic field strengths that we can talk about when we think about astrophysics very broadly. So for example, if I wanted to uh, plot one of the strongest astrophysical magnetic fields we know about on this plot, I would have to stretch it a good deal to the right. Magnetars are remnant objects left over from the collapse of massive stars when they die and they have extremely strong magnetic fields. Uh, so 10 to the 15 Gauss, you can see how many orders of magnitude we are now squeezing into our plot. And if I wanted, for example, to add the strength of the magnetic field between galaxies out in intergalactic space, I wouldn't know exactly where to plot that yet because it's a very difficult measurement to make, but I would definitely be stretching the plot to back to the left because the magnetic field in, in the intergalactic medium is much weaker than the magnetic field in interstellar space. But a lot of what we will chat about here today uh, is the magnetic field of our Milky Way galaxy. So this is the magnetic field in the interstellar space within the galaxy. This is of course, not an image of our own Milky Way. Being inside the Milky Way, we can't get outside to take a picture. But our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy uh, that, that has a flat pancake disk uh, much like this whirlpool galaxy. And so we can think of it as somewhat analogous. But my favorite physical system to study in the universe, and my favorite place to think about cosmic magnetism, 
is in what we call the interstellar medium. Astrophysicists abbreviate this ISM for short. And it is quite literally the stuff between the stars. Zoe's struck me as kind of a funny name for the thing that I have, uh, have been studying for a living. If I studied the ocean, I don't think I would go around calling it the stuff between the whales. It's sort of named for what it's not. The interstellar medium is, is literally everything within a galaxy, not in stars. And if that strikes you as boring, let me assure you and convince you that it's not because there's quite a bit inside galaxies that is not in stars. The interstellar medium is gas, it's dust, as we'll see in a minute, it has energetic particles, cosmic rays, and of course, magnetic fields. And the interstellar medium is not just passively sitting around filling space. It's a, an incredibly rich physical system to study because it is dynamic. It's the thing from which new stars are born. And it is the medium into which old stars die. So my, my analogy of the ocean and whales is, is really actually not a good one at all. Whales don't form out of the ocean, but stars form out of the interstellar medium. And so when we talk about the ISM, the interstellar medium, we're talking about just a huge range of physical states of matter and processes that connect that matter. Much of the volume of our Milky Way galaxy is filled with diffuse gas or plasma. This is extremely dilute relative to, for example, the air that we breathe here on Earth. In, in the very far reaches of the interstellar medium, you're, you're talking about an average one atom per cubic centimeter. But in pockets of the interstellar medium, this gas becomes dense enough that molecules can form from the atomic gas in the interstellar medium. And this, this we observe dense pockets of gas in galaxies that we call molecular clouds, essentially clouds of, of molecules and dust. And it's within these molecular clouds that certain regions, one way or another, become dense enough to actually collapse under the weight of their own gravity and form new stars. And everything that I'm showing you in this image right now is real data, no artist impressions to be found. This is, this is meant to illustrate the way we think about gas within the interstellar medium as, as cycling through a sort of life cycle. So diffuse gas can, can become dense and allow molecules to form and parts of those molecular clouds get dense and cold enough to have a, a parcel of space actually collapse and form a new baby star. And this is an observation uh, made with a, a telescope in the Atacama Desert of Chile of a disk around a newborn protostar. This is the, the type of disk from which new planets are formed as well. And then these stars live out their lives inside the interstellar medium, affecting it as well. So just like we talked about the solar wind, other stars and, and uh, most spectacularly massive stars also have winds of material that blow bubbles in the interstellar medium and otherwise affect the gas uh, of, of the ISM. 
And of course, they also are emitting light and that radiation is uh, interacting with the interstellar material. The most massive stars die very spectacularly in explosions called supernovae, which uh, dramatically reshape the interstellar medium in which they're embedded and enrich the gas and, and material of the interstellar medium for the next cycle of stars that forms and dies. And so you can imagine that there's just a, an incredible complexity to the physics that is going on within the interstellar medium. But one of the enduring mysteries, one of the things that, that we here at Stanford and, and our collaborators across the world are really trying to figure out is what role magnetic fields play in all of these different processes, all of these stages within the life cycle of the interstellar medium. And to figure that out, we need some way to measure interstellar magnetic fields. So you, you may never have thought about this before, maybe you have, uh, but take a second and think, how do we measure interstellar magnetic fields? I'm going to give you one or two answers to this. Uh, and this is one of the things that I hope you come away from this talk having learned. So here on earth, if we wanted to see the magnetic field of our refrigerator magnet or our bar magnet, we could, for example, just sprinkle some iron filings around it. These, these are little bits of iron, little magnetic materials that will organize themselves parallel to the magnetic field orientation. You might have actually done this experiment at some point, sprinkling the iron filings and seeing the shape of the magnetic field. In this case, uh, the, the magnetic field shape around the bar magnet is not too dissimilar from the magnetic field of our Earth. When we want to measure magnetic fields in space, we can't just fly our spaceship around dumping iron filings out the back of the spaceship and seeing where they end up. Space is, is obviously far too vast for that. And also that would be littering. <laughs> but it turns out that we don't have to do that because the interstellar medium, in addition to gas, contains a lot of dust. And so when you look up at the night sky in a very dark region on Earth, you'll see the plane of the Milky Way. You'll see this bright band of stars that is looking toward that pancake disk of our spiral galaxy. You might also see some very dark lanes of, of something. That's not a direction where there are no stars. That's actually interstellar dust obscuring some of the starlight that is behind it. So we, are stuck here on Earth. All of the information that we have to understand astrophysics, with few exceptions, comes to us from light that we can collect with our telescopes on Earth or very nearby in space. This light can be at different wavelengths, which helps us measure and observe different physics depending on where we're looking. But we can also obtain information from a property of light called polarization. And this is especially important to us for measuring magnetic fields. And you might already be familiar with the concept of polarization if you have ever worn polarized sunglasses that let you see more clearly on bright days. So we're going to investigate how this happens and, and what on earth this has to do with interstellar dust and measuring magnetic fields. Polarization is a property of light that refers to the geometrical orientation of the way that the light wave oscillates. So unpolarized light, your, your run of the mill light, has no particular direction of oscillation. So if we want to draw unpolarized light as a cartoon, We'll draw arrows pointing a bunch of different directions to indicate that no direction is particularly special. The polarized light is special. It has a particular direction of oscillation. So you can have horizontally polarized light 
that you can think of as a, a snake slithering in the grass. You can have vertically polarized light. This light is, is, has a, a particular direction that it is oscillating. And the reason that your polarized sunglasses are so effective for letting you see on very bright days is that light reflecting off the surface of the earth or reflecting off of, of the ocean or the road while you're driving picks up a horizontal polarization. What your sunglasses do then is only allow vertically polarized light to pass through the sunglass into your eyes. And so this, this bright glare off of, of the surface of the earth, this horizontally polarized light, is not transmitted through to your eye and you have a much clearer view of your day. Great. What does this have to do with space and dust? Well, remember I said that interstellar space is dusty, meaning that there are small particles of stuff out there in the interstellar medium. These are on average, not perfect spheres. You can think of them as little tiny grains of rice or little American footballs. That's, that's not a, a bad cartoon for the shape of these dust grains. And these dust grains find a preferential orientation with respect to the interstellar magnetic field. So these little dust grains are aligned in a particular way relative to the magnetic field in our galaxy. And this is, this is extremely useful for us. So light coming off of, of some distant star is generally speaking, unpolarized. Remember our cartoon for that is arrows pointing in all different directions. But this unpolarized starlight has to pass through a bunch of magnetically aligned dust grains on its way from the star to our telescope. And when it passes through these dust grains, because of their magnetic alignment, they absorb one component of the polarization preferentially, which means that the, the starlight that gets through to our telescope is actually polarized, not in a random orientation, but in an orientation parallel to the interstellar magnetic field, which means that by measuring the polarization of starlight, we are tracing the orientation of the magnetic field in the dust inside our galaxy. And, and we're doing it in a way pretty analogous to the way that your sunglasses help you see uh, at, a, at a sunny day at the beach. And so this is something that we can go out and do in order to study magnetic fields in our galaxy. We can point our telescope at a bunch of different stars measure the polarization and have a measurement of the interstellar magnetic field. So this is an, an old plot from, from back in the 70s uh, where each of these little line segments is a measurement toward an individual star of this polarization. This is, this is the pancake disk of our galaxy where there are a, a, bunch, of, a bunch more stars that have been measured. And you can, you can start to see some patterns in the magnetic field measured from this starlight polarization. This, this starlight polarization is actually the way that the interstellar magnetic field was discovered in the first place. And that was less than a hundred years ago. So we have made extremely rapid progress from figuring out this was out there to being able to measure and study it in all sorts of different ways. I, an important thing to add here is that these little magnetically aligned dust grains are also thermally emitting in, in infrared wavelengths. And so these dust grains are emitting polarized radiation, which is again polarized in an orientation that tells us about the interstellar magnetic field, which means that we can also go out and measure this polarized dust emission. We don't only have to study magnetic fields 
toward the locations of individual stars. And so if we look at the sky in visible wavelengths, we have all of this great interstellar dust that's obscuring our view of some of the starlight, but we can also use our telescopes to measure polarized emission from that interstellar dust and trace the magnetic field in the interstellar medium. And our ability to do this is relatively recent, or at least our ability to make spectacular maps like this one is relatively recent. This is a, a map of the entire sky. So looking in all directions from the earth that was uh, taken by the Planck satellite, which was a, a European space agency mission not too long ago. And the colors in this image are telling you how much dust there is in any particular direction. So here again is the disk of our spiral galaxy that's looking just toward the pancake. And looking up out of the galaxy, is, is up or down in this image. And so you can see in the blue, that's where there's relatively less dust relative to the disk. But what strikes you about this image is, is not just the colors, it's not just the orange and the blue, it's these uh, swirls of texture in the image, right? That is our measurement of the interstellar magnetic field from this polarized dust emission. So each of these swirls here is tracing the interstellar magnetic field that we measured by making a measurement of the polarization in these wavelengths. You can imagine that at every point, every pixel in this image, we have a measurement of the polarization. And then we simply took our paintbrush and swept it along the orientation of the magnetic field to smear out these swirls. That's, that's more or less how this visualization works, but this is, this is real data uh, collected by the satellite. And this has been just a, a treasure trove of data to explore and analyze and used to understand the structure of magnetic fields in the interstellar medium and how they affect all sorts of processes. So we can, for example, zoom in to regions of the sky that contain molecular clouds, these, these birthplaces of new stars. And so the, the bright, orange and red regions of the image here, uh, these are star forming molecular clouds that are relatively nearby to the sun. And these are great regions to study the influence of magnetic fields in something like the formation of new stars. This is actually the Orion molecular cloud, if, if, uh, if that rings a bell from the Orion constellation. So we can, for example, zoom in on these data to this particular region of the Orion molecular cloud, and we can compare what we see in, in dust polarization in the magnetic field with other ways that we can study the physics of this molecular material. So for example, direct measurements of, of molecular emission from gas inside these molecular clouds. So this is again, real data. Now, now with other telescopes that trace the gas from deep within this, this filamentary molecular cloud. And you're seeing a bunch of zoom-ins here. Those are, those are observations of the gas around new baby stars that are forming within this molecular cloud. This is a very active area of astrophysics research where a lot of progress has been made over the past hundred years or so, but 
with the really spectacular data that we are beginning to have and, and, and will continue to collect over the next uh, decades, we can start to ask questions that before we really could only uh, dream of having data to actually investigate. So it's, it's become clear in very recent years that newborn stars don't just form in lumps of molecular material, but, but tend to form in these very elongated filamentary structures. These, these long uh, tubes or filaments of, of gas and dust inside of which the material can actually get dense enough to collapse and form new stars. And the, the new thing that we are just beginning to have the data to tackle is to ask what role magnetic fields play in this picture. So this is, this is again, real data. The emission here in, in the colors is dust emission from a different satellite mission, uh, but toward the same portion of the Orion molecular cloud. And then the texture, if you can see in this image, those are the magnetic field measurements from this Planck satellite measurement of the polarized dust emission. And so there's a lot that we still don't understand about what's going on here. We think that interstellar magnetic fields are important for the way that these filamentary structures form and, and possibly for the, the where and the how and the what of the new stars that form. So these are, these are questions like, why does star formation proceed at the pace that it does? Why aren't stars forming a lot more quickly or a lot more slowly than we observe them to form? And how does this change based on your environment within our galaxy uh, or, or extending also to other galaxies in the universe? And this is one of, of uh, a number of what I think are just extremely exciting open questions in the field of cosmic magnetism. So we still don't know what the overall structure of our galactic magnetic field is. We're sitting inside it and we only have these, these particular ways of measuring some pieces of information from things like the polarization of, of dust uh, and, and of starlight. We have a number of other ways that we can put pieces together in the puzzle, but it's hard and it's, it's still an ongoing area of research to figure out what the actual 3D geometry of the magnetic field in the Milky Way is. And and that goes, of course, for other galaxies as well, where we want to understand how these magnetic fields come to have the shape and strength that we observe them to have in the modern day universe. My, my group here at Stanford is, is also very interested in how magnetic fields affect the motion of interstellar gas, not just when you get to the point of forming a star, but in every point of that life cycle of interstellar gas. And on, on an even more zoomed out scale, we still don't know when in the history of, universe, of the universe magnetic fields first appeared. So were they, were they around from very, very early on in the primordial universe or, or did they really come about when, when structures started to form in the universe? One of the reasons I love the study of cosmic magnetism is essentially that there's just so much that we still don't know. And I, I have uh, the, the privilege of working here with some really phenomenal students and postdocs and collaborators all over the world who are tackling these mysteries with some of the data and the techniques that we talked about today, including interstellar dust polarization. And, and new 
uh, methods of investigating magnetism that we are dreaming up right now. So thank you so much for listening and I'm very happy to take questions. Okay, um, we're gonna start uh, with questions. Um, Susan, if you don't mind, I'm actually gonna start with one of my own questions um, because I'm, I'm just, I'm just that, that was really, really interesting to see those filamentary molecular clouds. And I, it, my understanding of what you told us is actually really different from how I learned about star formation in graduate school with the idea that you have kind of like, you know, a roughly spherical molecular cloud that somehow the stars collapse. So I wonder if you could comment on that and, 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 and are magnetic fields required for this sort of new picture of stars forming in these very fil filamentary um, molecular clouds? Yeah, that is a great question. And it's, it's one that we're tackling right now because new information has come to light in just the last few years that has really changed that picture. So there was a very old model of the formation of stars that had a very important role for magnetic fields that, that was essentially supporting clouds against collapse. There's a very classical model of star formation where these, these spherical clouds would hang around in the interstellar medium, supported in part by pressure from magnetic fields, and they would, they would stay that way until gas became uh, dense enough and decoupled enough from the magnetic field deep within the interior of the cloud to allow gravitational collapse to take over and form a baby star. And so in that picture, magnetic fields are actually pretty essential, but our, our view of how they affect star formation has really shifted to a much less static picture where we, we, uh, we don't, it turns out, see these long lived magnetically supported clouds with, with strong enough magnetic fields uh, for that, that cartoon to be at least all that's happening out there. And instead, what we've realized very recently from, from data like I was just showing you is that the geometry of the magnetic field seems to have a, a special association with these dense structures that are forming stars. And so we see, for example, in the, in the diffuse regions of space that structures in the gas are very parallel, very aligned with the magnetic field orientation. But it seems like these dense filaments are actually tend to be perpendicular to the magnetic field orientation, which is suggestive, right? That, that perhaps the, the magnetic field geometry and its strength relative to uh, other influences on this gas are important for where these stars are forming or at least for the way that the filamentary molecular clouds are, are coming to be in the first place. So I think we've shifted from just, are magnetic fields important to where are they important and on what scales and, and how in a, in a physically intricate sense is this whole process taking place? Awesome. Oh, we're going to go to questions from the audience. If you haven't typed your question in YouTube, please feel free. Um, first question is going to be from Marilyn. Um, the question is really what causes the magnetic fields in the interstellar medium? And you may not have an answer to that, but <laughs> maybe yeah. you can shed some light on it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question that, that we would all love to know the real answer to. So uh, as, as I mentioned at the very end there, we don't know the ultimate origin of magnetic fields, uh, including in systems like our galaxy, we do have some at least theoretical understanding of how one can uh, build up a magnetic field uh, to the strength that we observe in galaxies today. Essentially, we have theories for 
converting mechanical energy, energy of motion into magnetic energy. Uh, we don't understand that. So, so these are theories uh, in a broad class called dynamo theory. We think that, that a dynamo is, is operating in systems like the Milky Way, but we don't have a detailed understanding of, of how that's happening uh, or, or exactly why, for example, here nearby the sun inside the Milky Way, why the magnetic field strength is, is six microgauss uh, rather than something else. Um, and so that is an area of extremely active research that I, I hope when you tune in again in, in a few years or hopefully not a few decades, that we'll have a much clearer picture of that. Great. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, we have a question from AC, which is about um, how you can observe magnetic fields um, from pulsars. And I guess just generalizing that a little bit, I mean, you talked mostly about observations of the cosmic microwave background. What are the other ways, um, including pulsars or anything else that we can learn about magnetic fields in our galaxy? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so we talked a lot about dust, right? And the, the two ways that it influences uh, the, the two ways that it gives us to measure magnetic fields from absorbing background starlight and from emitting its own polarized thermal radiation. We have other techniques that let us measure magnetic fields within our galaxy and in other environments. So one, uh, one thing we can look for is radiation from charged particles that are accelerated in magnetic fields and, uh, and are emitting uh, radiation at particular wavelengths or with a particular um, spectrum when we look at the light in multiple wavelengths um, that, that lets us know that it's generated by uh, this, this interaction between a charged particle and the magnetic field. Uh, we, we have um, even subtler ways of measuring magnetic fields. One of the things that I love about astrophysics, just, just broadly speaking, is that it intersects so many different disciplines of, of not just physics, but of, of chemistry and, and of all sorts of areas of science. And inescapably, it, it intersects uh, with, with quantum mechanics and with atomic physics and with, with the physics of uh, radiation. We have a, a, another way of observing magnetic fields that's, uh, that is to look for photons that correspond to particular atoms or molecules that, that have, uh, a, I'm trying to say this very simply, that um, emit a photon of a particular wavelength because there's a splitting in their energy levels when they're sitting inside a magnetic field. Uh, an, an example of this is called the Zeeman effect. And for measuring interstellar magnetic fields, it's actually very helpful because you might have noticed that when, in all of this talk about, about what we learn from dust, we're only ever directly talking about the orientation of the magnetic field. And that's actually not a way that we can directly measure the strength of the magnetic field. This, this daemon splitting uh, technique lets us make a direct measurement of the magnetic field strength, at least in under very particular circumstances. And, uh, and we are still figuring out, you know, how we can combine information from these different uh, wavelengths of light and different uh, physics that produces polarized light, um, how, we can, how we can put the pieces together in order to see the three-dimensional structure of magnetic fields in, in different environments. Okay, um, we've got lots more questions. We're, we'll take a couple of them. Um, here's a question. Um, can you look at the curved trajectories of charged particles to estimate the magnetic fields from the cross product of velocity and, mag and magnetic field. Um, yeah, maybe more generally, how do you use the trajectories of the of the charged particles? 
Um, yeah. Okay. So, so we, um, one way to answer this is that we need to understand the structure of the magnetic field, not just for its own sake as a fascinating research topic, although of course we want to do that, uh, but also for understanding things like the motion of, of uh, charged particles that are deflected in the interstellar magnetic field, in the galactic magnetic field on, on very, very large scales. And so in, in some sense, we have a back and forth between those observations and our understanding and, and modeling of the galactic magnetic field, where we're trying to, again, combine different pieces of physical information to get that complete picture. This is, again, a very active area of research for a lot of us. Great. Um, OK, I'm going to end with a kind of a fun question. Um, can you comment on any connections that there might be between the interstellar medium filaments on the scales that you're thinking about and things on much, much smaller scales like strings on, or you know something like that on, on really uh, on quantum mechanical scales? Is there any connection between those? That's a question from Judith. Uh, it's a it's a great question, and I would say that we are are figuring it out right now. We we are always at the forefront of how excellent we can build our telescopes to have the clearest picture at the highest resolution of what's going on. And every time we develop a new technology, we discover something completely unexpected. So we're we're improving our view of this interstellar material and, and our understanding of the physics is, is trying to keep pace. That's great. Before we end, I'm just gonna ask, I'm get, just gonna ask one more question. If you can um, kind of tell us what are you most excited about um, in terms of the data that's coming in, in your area? What, what's most exciting to you in the next few years? Ooh, that's a great question. With with honestly so many different answers, because one of the beautiful things about this field is that we're not just using one particular type of information or even one wavelength of data. And so I am extremely excited about new radio observations that, that uh, exist now or are coming online. I'm also very excited about new ways that we can measure this polarized dust emission. So the, the Planck mission was a satellite, um, but we also have ground-based telescopes, uh, things like the Atacama Cosmology Telescope or the upcoming Simons Observatory or, or CMBS4, a few of which are, are, all of which are at least partly located uh, in the Atacama Desert of Chile. And these are going to give us uh, even higher resolution views of this polarized thermal dust emission from the galaxy from here on Earth. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Susan. That was amazing. Um, I, I learned a lot and I'm sure the whole audience did too. Um, so thanks to everyone for joining us. And before we end, I'm going to pass it back to Sinan to make some, some announcements. So thanks. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Susan. Um, that was a fantastic talk. And uh, I love that Q&A there. Um, so for those of uh, you who are still with us at this point, um, I would like to quickly share with you a few resources where if you wanna follow us or um, being posted of our future events, uh, there are several channels that you could use. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Um, so first off, we have a um, event, right? Uh, all of you must have registered to get the event URL. So you could simply follow us there. Um, and I would also like to point to our um, website, which we actually have a specific page for this um, Discover Our Universe um, lecture series. Um, so we will be posting all our new lectures here, and our next one is actually scheduled um, on March 1st, and uh, there will be discussions about uh, alien life and UFOs. So I'm sure that's going to be a fantastic and super interesting talk for all of us. 
And finally, um, if you're on Facebook, we also have a Facebook page. And whenever we have new events, new talks scheduled, um, you can see us here. So um, different ways to follow us. And of course, we really, really value your time um, tonight to be with us. Um, so after this talk, um, perhaps sometime tomorrow, you'll be receiving a feedback form and we would really appreciate you taking a few minutes to give us some feedback um, regarding how you would like to um, hear about in the future talks, um, how we could do better, um, any comments that you have um, about us tonight. So um, with this, I guess I will uh, end it here. And uh, well, thank you everyone for coming. And I would also like to bring everyone back um, to the screen. So we could say a, a, a good night to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Great to thank have you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.